Positive Spin, presenting positive, innovative, and solution-oriented news from around the world. On today's program, we'll learn about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, signed on to by all the member countries of the United Nations. And we'll hear from a Brazilian astronaut about his plans to create the world's first ever eco-state in the rainforest. Then, we'll see how the United Nations is installing solar water pumps in Senegal for farmers to adapt to the water scarcity in that country. And we'll experience the annual Topanga Banjo Fiddle Contest and Folk Festival in Southern California. Finally, we'll visit the opening of the exhibit Summer of Love Experience, Art, Fashion, and Rock and Roll at San Francisco's De Young Museum. In 2015, during the annual meeting of the UN General Assembly, all the member countries agreed to achieve the sustainable goals by 2013. These 17 goals would dramatically change the world for present and future generations. In the following segments, we'll learn about the sustainable goals and their impact on humanity. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. When no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning. Asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has to die. Diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if half the world is headed back. We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money, but to all make all our, our lives better. We will live in the world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different communities. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, and progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the from climate, climate change. Where we restore and protect the, the life in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. We <laughs> restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. The United Nations General Assembly was the scene of a celebration in 2015, when 193 member countries adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, a unanimous commitment to end poverty, fight inequality, and tackle climate change. We need action from everyone, everywhere. 17 Sustainable Development Goals are our guide. They are a to-do list for people and planet and the blueprint for success. The SDGs are an agenda to balance human prosperity with protecting the planet. Imagine there's no countries 
UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Shakira asked global leaders to imagine a world where we achieve the goals by 2030. While fellow UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Angelique Kijo underscored a focus on Africa and developing countries. But the universal agenda is important to all nations, as leaders from developed countries also pledged to make the goals a reality. Poverty, growing inequality exists in all of our nations, and all of our nations have work to do, and that includes here in the United States. And that's why today I am committing the United States to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals build on the success of another 15-year plan. Created in the year 2000, the Millennium Development Goals sunset at the end of 2015. The MDGs halved extreme poverty, achieved equal primary education for girls and boys, and dropped HIV infection by 40% among many successes. The SDGs go beyond the MDGs by improving the lives of everyone everywhere and create a better world for future generations. Today, we are 193 young people representing billions more. The youngest Nobel Peace Laureate, Malala, calls on world leaders to keep their promise to every child. Each Lenten we hold represents the hope we have for our future because of the commitments you have made to the global goals. And Pope Francis advised world leaders to put humanity and the environment over politics. Los gobernantes han de hacer todo lo posible a fin de que todos puedan tener la mínima base material y espiritual para ejercer su dignidad y para formar y mantener una familia. 193 nations unanimously committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. It is so decided. But the journey starts here. Now's the time to take global action for local results and move our people and planet towards a sustainable future. When Brazilian astronaut Marcos Pontes viewed our planet's fragility from space, it set him on a new path to create the world's first environmental utopia in the Amazon rainforest. The project is being implemented in cooperation with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and aims at boosting the local industries in a clean and sustainable way, while at the same time protecting the Amazon rainforest. space is something amazing. In 2006, Marcos Pontes was the first Brazilian astronaut to go to outer space. He lived there, in that surface, that very thin layer. First sensation you have is that we are so small, so fragile. We depend on this planet pretty much for to everything that we, we need to survive. Orbiting over Brazil, Marcos was especially touched by the fragility of the Amazon, the world's largest rainforest and a major carbon sink storing greenhouse gases. And this giant natural defense against global warming is now under threat. Between 2000 and 2006, Brazil alone lost 60,000 square miles of rainforest. Returning to Earth a national hero, Marcos, now Goodwill Ambassador of UNIDO, the UN Industrial Development Organization, is committed to create what he says would be the world's first eco-state, a place to demonstrate that development and environment can go hand in hand. Roraima, located in Brazil's northern Amazon region, is nearly twice the size of England. It's the least developed and least populated area in the country with less than half a million people. And almost two-thirds of them live in Boa Vista, the capital. Today, this relatively untouched land is on the cusp of rapid economic expansion. More than ever, Marcos believes now is a critical time to ensure that it will grow sustainably without destroying the environment. My vision about the eco-state is something that will serve as a model 
for the, the rest of the planet and how sustainable development can be done in practice. Such as helping industries rethink and innovate how to use natural resources more efficiently, eliminate waste, promote renewable energy, and generate more green jobs. Look at this. This is waste wood at this time. But if you pay attention, you can see how good it is yet. So this part here, for example, could be used for furniture, could be used for so many different things. During processing, often up to 60% of this precious resource is discarded or burned. What they want to do here is to transform that waste in something useful, like energy for this company and for the communities around, and also to provide jobs for the people here in this community. Timber mill owner Jose Zani. That's an increase of 50 percent, all without cutting down another tree. In the next five years, UNITA will provide technical support for pilot projects like this. The focus will be on providing environmentally sound technologies, helping industries achieve maximum efficiency, but with minimum waste and carbon emission promoting renewable energy and building an eco-friendly infrastructure, laying a solid foundation for the development of an eco-state. A society where everyone values and uses natural resources carefully. Some may say it's an elusive, utopian idea, but Marcos is no stranger to impossible dreams. Growing up poor in the outskirts of Sao Paulo, Marcos had wanted to become a pilot since he was seven years old. When I said that, the first thing that I heard was, this is impossible, you're never going to be a pilot. This is just for rich people. And I became a pilot. Actually, I became an astronaut, the first one from, uh, of the country. Three, two, one. Lift off. Lift off of the Soyuz rocket transporting Jeff Williams, Pablo Vinagrada, and Marcos Pontes. I expect that my next flight in cities will not be like, uh, like scars on the surface of the planet, but beautiful tattoos that will integrate with the nature. This report was produced by Patricia Chan for the United Nations. In Senegal, the adoption of a solar-powered water pump was the first in a series of innovations that have successfully helped farmers to adopt to the water scarcity caused by climate change. The UN and other international organizations collaborated in this $30 million initiative. Here in Senegal, a country in West Africa, these women are gathering produce from their own garden. But only a few years ago, they struggled to grow anything at all because of soil degradation and lack of water due to climate change. Solar energy is used to pump water from the wells, ensuring that the 65 women in this cooperative have a steady supply for irrigation. This is all part of a $30 million investment by the Global Environment Facility and the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development. Improvements to irrigation systems and water management are underway and new farming practices have a positive impact on the communities. Avec l'utilisation donc des bonnes pratiques et des techniques aussi adaptées au changement climatique, euh, le projet donc est parvenu à améliorer donc la fertilité des sols, qui a permis aux ménages de, euh, et aux communautés euh, d'améliorer quand même en matière de santé, en matière aussi d'alimentation. 
One technique is to diversify production to cope with a change in climate. This provides a more varied diet with less chances of hunger if one crop fails. And with an abundant supply of water, these women are starting a new business, fish farming, a good source of protein and extra income for their families. To make the most of their yields, these women have also learned how to process their own food. Awa says they can earn more and at the same time reduce waste. <laughs> With this extra money, farmers can buy livestock and other food supplies. Awa, who was widowed five years ago, can now look after the 21 members of her extended family, including eight children and eight grandchildren. In a nearby village, more suitable crops are helping other farmers like Aja Dao make the most of their limited resources. Here, they can now grow a fast maturing rice variety that can thrive with less rain. The techniques and the good practices agricole nous ont sauvés dans ce sens. Maintenant, au lieu de cultiver beaucoup d'hectares, on peut cultiver un peu. Awa and Aja are among the more than 32,000 families who have improved their nutrition, health and incomes through these changes. And more importantly, they are now better equipped to face an uncertain future and to cope with the challenges of a changing climate. This report was produced by Sam Cole for the United Nations. In our next segment, we visit the Topanga Banjo Fiddle Contest, Southern California's favorite bluegrass, old-time music, and folk music festival. During the festival, Positive Spins host Bill McCarthy interviewed Gary Floyd, the festival's president and producer. Contest and Folk Festival with the producer, Gary Floyd, who's going to tell us about the festival, the importance of the festival, how it helps the community, and how long it's been in existence. Gary? Well, thank you, Bill. It's uh, actually 57 years, as you mentioned, and it's been going on as probably the premier Southern California traditional music contest because we feature contestants who are aged 7 to 70 and sometimes even up to their 80s. We, I think our oldest contestant was 89 one year. So we uh, strive to promote and to teach and to continue the culture of traditional music. And when we say traditional music, what do we mean? It's actually mostly music that is acoustic to start with. And that's one of our contest rules is that you can't play, you know, the electric guitar, but uh, you could try to work a modern rock and roll tune on a fiddle if you'd like and compete in the contest. But the idea is that people come, they are learning traditional instruments, and they are picking up things like Bill Monroe songs. A lot of our music that is played here actually predates 1940s. Sometimes it's the 1950s. We even have tunes that started out in the 1920s. So these are some of America's great Americana type traditions. We also have singing. And over the years, the folk festival part, we have dancing, we've done clog dancing, we've done various uh, flat foot dancing. We have a dance competition that goes on. We have a dance barn here. And while we're at it, we should talk about where we're at uh, this year. And 
for the last 28 years, we've actually been at this site location through our partner, the National Park Service, which is the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. So that's uh, one of our great cultural treasures for LA. It's one of the largest urban natural parks, even though you might think we're out in the middle of the forest, we are, but we're also part of the LA community. So the fact that we only get a, you know, a few thousand, these people go back home, they get invigorated, they go play, the kids who are taking lessons come out and they have a chance to play, but that's the competition, and some people don't even come for the competition, which uh, you might say, wow, what's that? So what they do is they come and do jamming. And jamming is like a bunch of people who get together under a couple trees, start playing a tune. Someone doesn't know the tune real well, well, they start hearing people who play better than them. And all of a sudden, they get a few lessons while they work. So it's uh, almost like uh, the best music tailgate you could probably experience today where everybody's here for a common cause. It uh, continues, uh, you know, from some of the early founders of the organization. So Sounds like a real positive spin <laughs> to me. You know, I, I, I have to say, if you hadn't taken the title already, we might have to adapt it for this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for the chance. Hi, I'm Aspen, and I'm going to be playing Florida Blues. Thank you so much. In our ongoing series celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, we join Positive Spin correspondent Evan Hirsch from Now Share Love at the opening of the Summer of Love experience at the De Young Museum in San Francisco, California. Hi, Bill. Here we are in Golden Gate Park. Oh, you know, that place where the Summer of Love happened 50 years ago. So what an appropriate venue then for the De Young Museum to host the Summer of Love we're here to share it with you. So come check it out. really started with the prints and drawings department because they have almost the entire run of the Fillmore and Avalon rock posters and Colleen invited me to join forces with her and we started to have this dialogue about this shared visual culture that was shown in both the rock posters and in the fashion. The exhibition in its current state really came about as a result of Max Holine starting at the Fine Arts Museums. Jill D'Alessandro and I pitched our previous exhibition idea to him, I think on his second day of work. And he was really excited about it and he said, you know, if we're gonna do a Summer of Love project here at the museum here in San Francisco, we need to do it big. So he gave us the big exhibition space and the exhibition blew up in such an amazing way. Rolling Stone came along in November of 1967, so another 50th anniversary, and then I got real busy once I hooked up with them. Uh, so it was always a little professional detachment, at the same time an admiration for the fact that young people were causing such a seismic shift in the cultural, the social, the political, the artistic, and the musical landscapes. It was an amazing, amazing achievement. Or hot pants made out of uh, satin, and it's a pie-in-the-sky applique that I designed. 
the little jacket is a ch what we called a chubby. And my mother actually, I told my mother how I wanted it to be and she helped put the thing together. She knit something and then we put all the blobs of color on it. And I wore that old, I still wear it. I wear it at Easter with rabbit ears. What was your reaction to having Stanley Mouse and Victor Moscoso and some of the artists here seeing their stuff on the wall? Oh, it's so exciting. I heard a rumor, though I didn't see it in person, that Moscoso was standing in front of our animated poster wall for like half an hour watching the posters move, and all of the posters in that space are his. You could see the development of the work. And there is a development. We start off quite crude. We're competing against each other, and we're copying each other. We're trying to one up each other. And collaborating together. We also <laughs> collaborated together. A lot of museums would not touch it because of the drug uh, thing. Any psychedelic influence in the artwork here? When I would look at a, a poster on psychedelics that I did, not on psychedelics, I would say to myself, how did I ever do that? It was communal living, it was uh, to a certain extent free love and, and uh, use of drugs and experimentation and, and tripping and having adventures. All of that was fine, but in the end you do have to pay the rent. Everything was romantic and fun and creative. You could make money doing anything creative. If you wanted to do macrame, if you wanted to crochet, you could make money doing it. So it was a great time. Maybe we'll have a revolution of creativity again. It would be fun. You could go into strangers' kitchens and see all of this. So every, every place that you went to was like a little museum of yours and the other guy's work and they were cheap. It was a buck. I think so much of what happened in the 60s was all about personal action and group action and the idea that people can all work together to change, change the world. Well, that was a trip. What did you think? Tune in next month when we give you more coverage from San Francisco and the Summer of Love 50th Anniversary Celebration. Peace out. Well, that's our show for today. We hope this program has inspired you to take action in your local community to create a better world. I'm Bill McCarthy. I'm Evan Hirsch. I'm Brenda Lynn Martin. I'm Ron Sato. And we want to remind you that everyone can make a difference. Go out and make some positive, positive news. news.